Praise the Lord. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Lord, there's no one like you. Lord, as we gather around your word, we worship you. We thank you that you're a mighty God, that you're a gracious God, that you're a merciful God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, in heaven that for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this time in worship, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the communion, Lord. We thank you for everything that you have done. You are gracious. You have given to us bountifully, Lord, and we just praise you for it this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord, that you have given to us, Lord, to teach us, to instruct us, to feed our souls, and, Lord, to tell us more about you. And that is our desire, Lord, that we might know you better, that we might draw closer to you, that we might have a greater understanding with you, that our relationship with you, Lord, might be formed on truth of the reality of who you are, not on something that we desire, but on who you are. Lord, we praise you this morning. We pray that you are glorified in this word, in this message. You take our words, Lord, and you encourage, Lord, and you lift up Jesus. That's our desire. In the name of Jesus, be lifted up. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Uh, this morning, the title of my message is The Lamb. Um, uh, the Lambs, obviously, were building up, uh, preparing for Easter and the celebration of his resurrection. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, please turn with me to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. And we want to lay a wee bit of a foundation to start with here. Genesis 22, a story that we'll be familiar with if you've... Um, because it's been preached on numerous times over the years... And actually, we'll just start at verse number six, Genesis 22 and verse six. And we'll read a few together. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two men went, uh, to the, two of them went together. Uh, then they came to a place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed wood in the altar. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar uh, and upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took, his, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And we'll just stop there. Uh, Sharon and I love to travel. We love to travel throughout. Uh, well, I, like, I like going to Europe because Europe's an awful lot easier to get to, the quicker to get to. We love to go to European cities. We were in Germany there last year, going from uh, city to city and town to town. Uh, and one of the things we like to do is to visit the churches, visit their cathedrals. Uh, even in Rome, we visit the basilicas. It's fascinating to see the architecture, the artistry, uh, everything from the entrances with the grand entrance, entrance arches to the altars um, and all of the stuff in between. <laughs> it's a fascinating to see. We love doing it. It's something we do uh, to see how people are expressing creatively their beliefs. Now, I don't pretend and I don't want you to think that I necessarily believe that the same things. Um, there's a very much a difference between what I would believe and what some of the things that are expressed or believed in those places. But it's fine to go into them, I find, to uh, admire the architecture, to admire the artistry, to admire the, the, uh, the, all of the things that are in there. Um, however, whenever we go into those places, I'm always reminded of the sincerity that many people who go into them and worship, many people who traditionally go in there, you'd see the tourists going in and taking their pictures and doing their wee circuit and doing all their things. Uh, but then there's always one or two people who are sitting there and they're praying or they're, they're uh, reading the scriptures or doing the rosary or whatever it might be. 
Um, but in those places, it's something that you're, you're struck by, the, the wonder of it all, the way that they try to architecturally, it's fascinating, isn't it? They try to architecturally reproduce the presence of God, but it's so much better to have the actual presence of God. So much better far, far better. So they try to do it architecturally and artistically. But we go into those places and we see the, the uh, artworks, we see the sculptures, we see the statues representing p- the patriarchs in the Old Testament. We see the apostles, you see Jesus being depicted. And again, as I said, there's things that we disagree with, but leave that aside as it were. But one of the things that we always see over and over again is its depiction. It's this image is called Agnes Dei, uh, this is in windows, stained glass windows all over the place. Um, it is a lamb usually carrying a cross or sometimes a banner. And you'd see it in their stained glass, glass windows. Agnes Day is also the name of one of my favorite choral pieces. Uh, Samuel Barber composed Agnes Day, which is a fascinating piece. Um, if you want to look it up later on, I'd, I'd advise it. My brother would just call it weird monk music, but I I think it's brilliant. Uh, The late, great Rich Mullins sang a song um, with the same name. Agnes Dei is the Latin word for the Lamb of God. This is one of the most remarkable names for Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God. And this morning, I want to take a few minutes and look at the Lamb of God. And this is not just as a title, but as a person. Because although it's a title that's used in reference to Jesus, it's, there's something about the titles and the names of God that are not just things that sit out in the atmosphere. They're not just ethereal me- words that mean nothing. They're rooted, whenever there's a title or a name for God, it's rooted in his character. It's rooted in his nature. It's rooted in the things that he does. He just doesn't say that he is the, the healer and not heal. He doesn't just say that he is gracious and not be gracious. He is those things, because, and that's in his name, but it is because that's who he is. It's rooted in who he is. In our text that we've just read there, we have God instructing Abraham to take his son Isaac up the mountain in order to sacrifice him. He's, you know, he's, t- he's told him to take him up there in order to sacrifice him. It's a fascinating passage. It's fascinating to go into it in depth, but I'm not going to do that this morning. My focus isn't on that. But in verse 8 there that we've read, it says, God will provide for himself a lamb. His words to his son, they're full of faith and actually prophetic. What we see going on is prophetic. There's things here that are important for us to take note of. Abraham did not say to Isaac when he asked him, what are we going to sacrifice? He didn't say, well, brace yourself, you're it. You're the lamb I'm going to sacrifice. He had intended to because that's what God had told him to do. But he didn't say that. He said, God will provide for himself a lamb or the lamb. His words to his son are full of faith. He says here that God, Elohim, the supreme God above all other gods, would provide for himself a lamb. Luther, reflecting on this passage, actually says that, that, that basically that Abraham is being nice to his son. He's being compassionate. It was not Abraham's true intention to torture his son by saying, just wait and see. When we get up there, I'm going to sacrifice you. The details of the divine command, uh, he didn't torture his son with the details of the divine command. And that is why he told Isaac that God would provide a lamb. Luther paints him as more compassionate than faithful. Genesis 22 and verse 13, we've read as well, says, then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. After being stopped by God or by the angel of the Lord, this ram appears. Maybe there was others around. We don't know, but he looks around at that point and he finds one ready at hand to offer, ready to sacrifice. The only note I want to make is that it says the words of Abraham is that God would provide a lamb. And here he finds a lamb, a ram, sorry. The lamb usually refers to a sheep that is less than a year old. Any sheep that is less than a year old. A ram, in comparison, is a mature male sheep. 
Now, we know that when we read the scriptures, and especially when we read the Old Testament, we know that there are events, there are things that are happening, there's things that we can read about that are types and shadows that point towards the New Testament, that point towards Christ. These events with Abraham taking his son up a mountain has strong prophetic implications. There's things in it that we need to remember. We need to know that we know that Abraham believed that if he obeyed God, if he took his son up there as God has instructed him, he knew that God was going to raise him from the dead. God was going to have to do something miraculous. He tells us, actually we're told in the New Testament, the writer to the Hebrews, he tells us in Hebrews 11, he says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, including that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. God had told him to take your child up the up. up My, my assistant was reminding me I hadn't flipped. Um, God had told him to take the child, take Isaac up the mountain and to sacrifice him. And he, and he believed that God would raise him from the dead. See, in his heart, he knew God had told him, that was it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do whatever God has told me to do. What a man. What a remarkable faith. The wonder of it all is that the fact is, to blow your mind, God had never raised anyone from the dead. It had never happened before that time. He never, there's nowhere in the scriptures or before Abraham going up that mountain, there's nowhere where we read that God raised someone from the dead. We don't read it. And yet such was his faith. Amen. Such was his trust in almighty God. God told me to do it. God told me that my seed would be named and blessed through Isaac. Hallelujah. That I know God can do that. God could raise him from the dead. What? God's never raised anyone from the dead. He'd never done it before. Such was his faith that no matter what God had said, God was going to accomplish it. And I'm not going to limit God in what way he's going to do it. Amen. God said he's going to, he's going, he's going to bless, my, bless my seed through Isaac. Therefore, whatever's going to happen to Isaac, God's going to do it. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, to think about it, that his faith was such that God can do anything. God can do anything. Imagine if we had the same confidence. Imagine if we had the same faith in Almighty God. See, we try to work it all out. What could God do? He told me this. But what could he do to, do to bring that about, to fulfill that? Well, he could do this, or he could do that, or he could do the other. Abraham, he threw the book out and says, you know what? He's never done this before. He can do that if he wants to. <laughs> Don't limit God in your experience. Don't limit God's promises over your life, over your family. Don't limit God and say, God, it's too late. As time has passed, there's nothing you can do. The child is dead. Don't even limit God. God is a mighty God. God can do something that you have never even expected. He can do something that you've never even thought of. Abraham takes his son up a mountain, but is prevented from sacrificing him. Eventually, quite possibly, many scholars believe that in the same area that another father would watch his son going up a mountain, but God would not stop him from being sacrificed. On that day, Abraham's words would be proven true because God would indeed provide for himself a lamb. It's nearly 2,000 years later. The lamb of God would appear but not a domesticated animal, a livestock, not a furry woolen uh, animal. Instead, the Lamb of God would have come and he'd be identified as a person. He is identified as the Lamb who takes away sin. The Lamb who takes away sin. Turn with me to John chapter one. John chapter one. Sorry, 
uh, John chapter 1, and actually we'll just start at verse 26. It says, Then John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me uh, comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I kept, came baptizing with water. And we'll just stop there. It was a normal day at the River Jordan. There, there there's a strangely dressed man who's standing in the water. Uh, he stood waist deep in the water. Around him were his students, his disciples. They were funneling people to him as his crowd had gathered to hear his words. They came, they were drawn by his, his not only his, his appearance, his, his attitude, his words, his message. They were drawn to it. His message of repentance resonated with them. It struck a chord with them. It, it caused them to, to come out and to see what was going on. And it caused them to come and to be baptized. And they recognized the truth of his words, as I said. It resonated in their hearts, and they responded to the message and to him. He was more than just a reed that was shaken by the wind. Instead of preaching a message of holiness, which is what the Pharisees had, were preaching, John preached the message of repentance. Their message had emphasized their efforts. It emphasized their accomplishments. It emphasized their behavior. It emphasized their worthiness while well, John's message emphasized their inadequacy to satisfy the law of God, it also emphasized the mercy of God and the grace of God. Very different messages from very different vessels, as it were. John acknowledged when confronted that he was the forerunner, that he wasn't the Messiah, he wasn't the one who's going to deliver Israel. He had acknowledged that he was just there beforehand, the forerunner to prepare the way for the Messiah. He was the one who came before Christ. Christ, which means the anointed one, which means the chosen one. In Hebrew, it is Mashiach or the Messiah. The humility of John, I mean, the absolute humility. I mean, he's, he's, he's standing there. He's got this crowd gathering to him. And yet he, he's in humility. He says, he's coming after me. and I'm not even worthy to unlatch his straps on his sandals. I'm not even worthy for that. In the context of Bible prophecy, the Messiah refers to the anticipated Savior, the Redeemer and Deliverer who is anointed by God to fulfill a significant role in the divine plan of salvation. The Messiah is regarded as the chosen one, anointed with divine authority to bring about the ultimate establishment of God's kingdom on earth. This was the one that John was to prepare the way for. He was to prepare the people for. He was to prepare the hearts and the minds of the people. John says that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sons of the world. He didn't say, behold the Messiah. He didn't say, behold the Son of God. He didn't say, behold the, new, the King of Israel. No, instead... He, instead of using one of the divine titles that they would have been familiar with, one of the divine titles they would have known from the Old Testament, instead of using one of those, he, John uses words that draws their minds back to the Old Testament, to the sacrifices. He uses, he uses, calls Jesus the Lamb of God who, who takes away the sin of the world, drawing their mind back to the sacrifices for atonement, the sacrifices that were given by men on behalf, of, on behalf of themselves for their sins. Even as John uttered these words, it's almost like the final bell for his ministry. Behold, the lamb is here. My time is up. This lamb, now he's going to supersede me. The divine identification of the lamb of God with the sins of the world. It was not lost in those who considered these things deeply. Some of John's disciples even followed after him. 
It wasn't a racial, it wasn't a, a local thing just for the Jews, just for them to be delivered, because that's how people understood it. This was for the whole world, those who came to Christ, those who would accept that sacrifice, identify with it, they would then also have that same joy of being forgiven for their sins. Micah tells us in Micah 7, 18 and 19, it says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the seas all of our sins into the sea of his forgetfulness. He takes away the sin of the world, takes it away totally. Psalmist says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But in order to be the Lamb, he had to be a Lamb without blemish. The Lamb without blemish. God had established in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, he had established what was required when they bring a lamb as a sacrifice, as an offering to God. They had, he had established that it had to be a spotless lamb. It had to be a pure lamb. It had to be a, plant, a lamb without spot or blemish. The children of Israel have been told that in, in Exodus when they were coming out of Egypt before they came out. We told in Exodus 12 that before they came out, what they were to do was to have the lamb and they were to examine it. It was to be a spotless lamb. Uh, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. There was loads of lambs out there. They were all, maybe some of them were blemished. Maybe most of them were blemished. They weren't perfect. They were, they had Something wrong with them, maybe? But they had to choose a perfect lamb, one that was without spot or blemish. The lamb of God was perfect. We're told in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, Glory to God. Imagine, imagine. It says corruptible things like silver and gold. Silver and gold, corruptible. Comparison to him it is. Comparison to him, him it has no value. He is altogether lovely. He is altogether precious. He is the precious lamb of God, the lamb without blemish and without spot. In the Old Testament, the Levites and the priests would evaluate the lamb. They would evaluate it. They would examine it in order to see if there was any blemish on it, if there was any spot. Jesus was examined. He was examined for three years. He spent amongst the common man. People, he would talk to them. He would preach with them. He spent time with them. He would heal them. He would minister to them. He would talk to them. He would deliver them. And people seen him and people responded to him. People were drawn to him. If there'd been something in his character and in his nature that was repulsive, they wouldn't have been drawn to him. People responded when they seen him. Before his crucifixion, the Lamb of God was examined thoroughly before, uh, in his trial. He stood before Caiaphas, the current high priest, Annas, the former high priest and the assembly of the religious leaders of the Sanhedrin. These ecclesiastical council, as it were, gathered and sought to find reasons to crucify him, reasons to uh, uh, kill him. They tried to accuse him of blasphemy. They looked for something in order to, they, to denounce him over. They couldn't prove a thing against him. They even went as far to try to drum up accusations to get people to come along and to make up lies about him in order to feel justified, to, justified for hating him, justified for punishing him tells us in Matthew 26, says, now the chief priests, the elders and all the council sought false, false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. They found no reason to. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, 
I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. They didn't even lie. They just misunderstood what he meant. They used that as an accusation against him. He said he would do it, but he was talking about the temple of his flesh. They couldn't find anything, any justifiable reason to, in order to, to punish him, in order to kill him. But he wasn't just evaluated on a religious grounds. He was also criminally examined by Herod and Pilate. Pilate, the head of the local government, Pilate, he only cared about the, the civil events and civil aff affairs. He only cared about legal affairs, not religious affairs. So you find whenever they went to Pilate, they didn't say to him, he said this about the temple. They didn't do that at all. In fact, when, it, when they went to him, their accusations were about uh, uh, causing, inciting people to riot. They're about forbidding people to pay taxes and about claiming to be king. Things that, that, were, that weren't religious things, they were, they were civil things. And Pilate examined them, he talked to Jesus, he asked him questions, he, asked, he had a, a good discourse with him. And actually in John 18, 38, Pilate said to him, said to Jesus, what is truth? And instead of waiting for an answer, he walked away. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him. Legally, there was no reason for it. We got, there's no religious reason for it. No, there was no legal reason. There was no grounds for them to be killing him. There's no grounds for them to be sacrificing him or, or on the cross. Pilate could find no legitimate reason to punish Jesus. He found no crime, no blemish in his character. He found nothing about his behavior. He hadn't stirred up a people for rioting. He hadn't done anything that would have justified it. Matthew, the eyewitness, records, he says, then Pilate, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail with the, the chief priests and the elders when he couldn't convince them to let Jesus go, he says, but rather that a tumult was rising, so they were getting agitated, they were going to have a riot. Hey, they're accusing Jesus of, of, of instigating a riot. They're, they're doing it themselves. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. So he's declared it twice. I find no fault with him and I am innocent of this, the blood of this just person. Both the religious and the secular elites could find nothing against him, no reason to punish him, no reason to sacrifice him. So he was spotless before them. He was perfect before them. But more importantly, he was perfect before Almighty God. The verse that we've already just read there, 1 Peter 1, 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but he was the lamb of God without blemish. He was the lamb who suffered. He was the lamb who suffered. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. probably one of the best known passages in relation to Christ and his suffering. Isaiah 53. And verse three, we'll start out actually. It says that he is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from the judgment. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. 
and they, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. There's no doubt that he suffered. Reading the eyewitness, the testimonies, the eyewitness accounts of what he went through, there's absolutely no doubt. No doubt the horrors of it, the, the, the brutality of it, the cruelty of it. It's made all the more inhumane and cruel when you consider the life that he had led to this point. When you consider his, his I was going to say his personality, but his actions, his character, the things that he had done. How he had gone around healing people. How he had gone around uh, uh, helping people, delivering people who were bound. How he had gone around and through his teachings, he'd been lifting up the poor, lifting up those who were rejected, those who were overlooked. Lifting them up and elevating them and say, listen, but you know, really we would say before the foot of the cross, everyone is equal. He was going around doing that, lifting people up. Uh, Brother Trevor and Hazel there were just back from India with their caste system, where it says that one person is on this level and will never get out of it, another person's in this level and will never get out of it, another person's in this level. Jesus came along and he said, you know what, we're all on the same level. And he came and he did that and they crucified him. The brutality of it, the cruelty of it. Now, if he had been a vicious man, if he had been an aggressive man, if he had been a, a man like Barabbas who started up insurrections, who'd been cruel, some of the cruelties we see going on in our world today, if, if he had been a cruel man like that, you could say it, it, was a just, it was a justified. There wouldn't be much suffering because he justified. He deserves what he got. But he wasn't like that. He was merciful. He was gracious. He was the hand of Almighty God extended. When you add on that, on top of that physical pain and suffering that he went through, the beating, the scourging, having his beard pulled out, having the crown of thorns pressed under his head, having the, the, the nails piercing his hands and his feet and the spear in his side, you consider all of that. And then you add on top of that the emotional, mental, and spiritual elements. I mean, pure. He was spotless without blemish. There was nothing about him that it was perf absolutely perfect, and yet he had our sins put on him. He bore our sins. He took them on the cross. A man, you know, who'd never known sin, and yet he took it upon himself. Prophet Jeremiah talking about this talks says, but in Jeremiah 11, but I was like, I did it again. Uh, but I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter. And I did not know that they had devised schemes against me saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name may be remembered no more. That was their intention. That was, a, that was the enemy's intention that people would never remember him. He's healed a few people, but once they're gone, once they pass away, who's going to remember him? That was their intention. But oh, how, how much they failed. They absolutely failed. That name that is above every name, that name that will never be forgotten, that name that we will sing praises to throughout all of eternity. The lamb who suffered, he was the lamb who was sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Passover there. The, the, you can't read the word Passover and not think of the Passover celebration. You can't think of Passover and not remember the lamb that was at the heart of the Passover. There is no Passover without a lamb. There is no Passover without the lamb. It was the lamb dying that caused the angel to pass over. So therefore, it, this is the Paschal lamb, the Passover lamb. It is for indeed Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. He died for us. It was his shedding of blood and death that acquired for us not just the benefits that previous Passover lambs had acquired, not just those benefits, because he was greater than any lamb of the pasture. He was greater than any sacrifice that had ever been given ever been taken part, ever been experienced or, or shared. He was far greater than that. 
And because he was a son of God, therefore his benefits lasted longer. They didn't just last for a year. It didn't just last for whatever sin you're, you're performing a sacrifice for. His sacrifice on the cross for our sins when he bled and shed his blood and died means that we're forgiven. And not just this lifetime, in all of eternity when we're worshiping him and praising him, we'll still be able to sing, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the lamb, redeemed by the, by, I can't even remember the words, I love to proclaim it. We'll be able to say it in all of eternity because it'll still be true. Because he was far superior than any, any sacrifice that had ever been given. Isaiah 53 and verse 8, which we've read there, he was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. What else can that mean except that he died? He cut off from the land of the living. Paul writing out to the Philippian church in Philippians 2 says, and being found in appearance as a man, oh, he's a lamb, found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So there is no doubt tonight, uh, my atheist friend, my Muslim friend, there is no doubt this morning, I should say, that he died on that cross. Absolutely no doubt. The atheist and the Muslim will argue that point. Neither of them believe that he died, but he died, he died, he died. That has been attested to and finally, he is the lamb who conquers. He is the lamb who conquers. Colossians chapter 2, 13 and 15 says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. Uh, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out all, the, uh, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public specta- spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Glory to God! Amen. Glory to God. even Brian could say glory to God there. Glory. <laughs> glory to God! That's one of those passages you read it and you go, glory to God! Yeah. It's been done. Right. Having, I love it. It says he took in that handwriting, hadn't written list of requirements that were against us. It's almost really, we could almost say, having taken that list of requirements that we failed to meet, that list of reasons why I wasn't righteous, the list of reasons why I wasn't able to enter the presence of God. Having taken all of my failures in that regard, taken them all, written them on a note and nailed it to the cross. All the reasons why I wasn't acceptable. He took that list and he nailed it to the cross. When he was nailed, that, was, that list was nailed. He did not stop on just dealing with our sins. As that passage tells us, he disarmed principalities and powers, making a public show of them. You know, whatever sin you were bound to, whatever sin that you were bound to before you came to know Christ, whatever sin was on your background in your history, that sin no longer has a control over you. It no longer has power over you. The power of sin over your life has been broken. Broken. That sin no longer has a hold on your life. Yes, the presence of it might be there in the peripherals, but it no longer has a hold on you. It no longer has a hold, whether it was a a sin, an addiction, or anything like that there. He came and he broke it. When we come to him and acknowledge him as our savior, what happens is he sets us free from that bondage. Whatever that dirty old sin has no power over your life. It has no power over your future. You don't have to give into it. You don't have to accept it. I just want to invite the praise team at this time to come to the front. As I read for you that Revelation Chapter 5, he is the lamb that conquers. Revelation chapter 5, it says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns, which speaks of power, having seven eyes, speaking of complete awareness or vision, which are the seven spirits of God, which is complete the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, the application of the Spirit. 
And when then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Glory to God. He conquered. He had to go through it all, but he conquered in the end. Victorious. Praise the Lord. We don't come before a lamb that is still suffering. He suffered. It's done. He died. It's done. Now we're coming before a victorious lamb to celebrate and rejoice. To praise him for who he is. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Let's express our praise to God by clapping our hands. <laughs> praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise you, Lord. 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 Amen.